Are any countries besides the U.S. doing bivalent boosters? Yes, the U.K. And interesting, the U.K. is doing a, uh, a BA1 booster. Mm-hmm. Canada, I think it's doing a BA1 booster, even though it's really all BA4, BA5 now. Why can't we just get the old booster? And I think we've answered that because you can't. The CDC thinks this one is better. But people say, well, uh, there may not be a lot of evidence in young people, but what's the harm in getting this booster? Is there any harm? Well, so so one, the, you do develop a transient for, for a young male, for example. I mean, if my, my son is in his 20s. Um, I actually just turned 30, but um, <laughs> you know, he, he's a young male. I do, young males, you know, are, as we've shown, do have an increased instance of clinical myocarditis. And now for you to see this study, for example, uh, there was one actually done at Ohio State University. Now there's one in Thailand. There's also a big, not surprisingly, a sort of area under that tip of the iceberg of subclinical myocarditis. Um, uh, that's not trivial. I, you know, I, you do spill troponin or tr- spill creatine kinase into your bloodstream. It, this is not, it, it's, I wish we had a different word than myocarditis, because I think when people think myocarditis, or I think myocarditis, I think Coxsackie infection, you know, where there it's a cytopathic effect on cells. There, you know, kids are getting admitted to the ICU and, you know, 9, 10% die from that. I mean, that's that's different. That's a much, much more serious illness. This is an immune mediated and re- relatively short lived, but is there, a, you know, a bigger story to tell over time? So I, I think if, if there's, the benefits are clear, then sure. Get get the vaccine. Well, so so let me try and put it in perspective. Um, when the vaccines were first licensed in December 2020, the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna vaccine, they were two dose vaccines. And um, one year later, December 2021, there was a study that actually um, Dr. Griffin reviewed by Mark Tenford that was published in Clinical Infectious Disease that tried to answer the question: Was protection against serious illness holding up? Because that's the goal. That's the only reasonable goal. It's the only attainable goal. And what he found was that it was, and and this was a study of about 10,000 people, protection against severe disease was holding up for all age groups, um, for all comorbidities. And this was through Delta. It included D614G, Alpha, Delta. So then in December, end of December, Omicron hit, and then the Omicron subvariants. And with that, the CDC then did a series of studies trying to answer the question, was there a value in a third dose and then later a fourth dose? And with that, and there was, I mean, the, the, these are their data. These, this is what they've published, that, that there was an advantage to a third dose in terms of preventing hospitalization. And then to a lesser extent, there was an advantage to the fourth dose. But who was benefiting? This, this is their publication. What, what they found was that not everybody equally benefited. Those that, that most benefited from protection for protection against hospitalization were number one, older people. And by older people, really, in this study, it was like people over 75, which is good, because now I'm, I'm not quite in that group yet. It's it's the what Rochelle Walensky wants to find is the elderly, elderly, God bless her. So those over 75. Um, people who were in nursing homes, the people who um, had the kind of uh, health problems that put them at, at serious risk of being hospitalized, even with a mild illness. You know, so so severe lung disease, severe heart disease, people who had type one diabetes that was relatively out of control and others, where even a mild illness would be a problem. And then lastly, people who are immune compromised. So I think it is reasonable as we approach fall and winter to to focus on those groups. So, so I, I did take... Um, uh, some ex- not exception to, but I just I just felt like I wrote an op-ed actually that was published recently in the Wall Street Journal that, that basically just said that. Let, let's focus on those groups because they're the ones who are most likely to benefit. Uh, Paul, I have another question that you didn't mention. Obese people or people of color malnourished. Right. I agree. But so, certainly o- obesity should be on that list. It wasn't on the on the, that CDC paper, but you're right. And yeah, and true, true people, uh, black, blacks are disproportionately represented. Also true. Can I ask a question for clarification? Um, when you look at the data about those groups being the most likely to benefit, is that specifically because of the risk of mild disease or is it because the other groups are already so well protected that it's sort of there isn't enough room to see any additional improvement? That's a great question. I, I, I maybe both. I, I think that, that certainly those who are uh, it, it, it's still very possible that, that two doses for a healthy young person continues to protect against serious disease. I, I mean, certainly with that third dose, Linda Safe and others have shown that you do get a broadening of the immune response to include these uh, these Omicron subvariants. So there, I think there is an advantage to a third dose. But 
Um, it, it, and, and I'm not sure why. I mean, it, it may be that the people who are elderly just don't make very good T cell responses. And so they need to sort of constantly be protected against mild disease or else they progress to severe disease. And that may also be true for people who are so um, frail, I think, in terms of their underlying serious illnesses, that even a mild illness lands them in the hospital. And then immune compromised people, obviously. That, that term is not a good term because it's such a broad term. And there are people who are so very different in terms of how they're immune compromised. But in any case, those, those were the data. So when, when the CDC then on September 1st said this vaccine is recommended as a booster, this new bivalent vaccine is recommended as a booster for everybody over 12, I, I, I just um, think that's probably broader than they need. Do you think that there's a, a downside to it? I think there's a downside to any biological. I, I mean, if you if you look at uh, anything that has a positive effect, I think in medicine can have a negative effect. If you look, for example, at the, um, there was a study that just came out of Thailand, which I don't think you guys have reviewed, but it was um, a study that Pfizer was actually asked to do a while ago in the U.S., and they did it later in Thailand. But th what they looked at it was, was people uh, 13 to 18 years of age. So there were 300 students in Thailand, 13 to 18 years of age, who received two doses of Pfizer's mRNA vaccine. At, right before the second dose, they obtained blood and then also obtained blood at 3, 7, and 14 days later. And what they found was that um, in 2.5% of those children, there was a rise in, in, in troponin, a rise in creatine kinase, suggesting that there was transient heart muscle damage. That was self-resolving, limited, but you do make an immune response to your own heart. You do. It's, it, it doesn't appear to be serious, but you do do that. And you wonder over time whether there'll be a spectrum of illness associated with that. But, you know, and, and in 2020, you guys know this, there, there was a uh, paper published showing that there was molecular mimicry between SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and the, and the heavy chain of alpha myosin. So that, that may be, which is why it also happens when you, you're naturally infected. 